welcome to the presentation on vocabulary and morphological awareness. What do you already know about how language develops? Well, typically children learn words from the people around them. Oral conversations are context rich in ways that aid vocabulary acquisition. So we've got a small set of words accompanied by gesture and intonation when used with great frequency and to talk about a narrow range of situations that children are exposed to on a daily basis, they start to internalize and use um, language. Deb Roy's The Birth of a Word gives a fascinating glimpse into language development. He set up video and audio recording in his home um, from the day that his son came home from the hospital all the way through his son's first production of the word water. And what the data show are um, constructs that Roy refers to as a word scape. So the, the correlation was attempts at using the word water occurred more frequently um, at a higher volume in places in his house where there was running water. So it starts to look like um, a word scape or a mountain, and it kind of tells us this idea that um, context, repetition, and um, use with people around us help shape the development of a word or the birth of a word. So I'll link to this TED Talk on Canvas, and you can check out um, Deb Roy's TED Talk there. At school age, vocabulary development takes a little bit of a shift because children are exposed to more written language. And written language contains thousands of words, more so than what's used in typical oral conversation, but writing lacks the interactivity and nonverbal contextual support that oral conversation affords. So there's three main points to keep in mind when we think about vocabulary instruction. First, words are complex and meanings are not always clear. Second, vocabulary knowledge is linked to reading comprehension. And three, context clues to determine word meaning are not intuitive for every reader. Mark Twain reminds us that the difference between the almost right word and the right word is really a large matter. It's the difference between the lightning bug and lightning. Why is vocabulary important? Well, we've got a large body of research conducted over a prolonged um, time period establishing a correlation between extensive vocabulary and strong reading comprehension. Young readers need to have a strong vocabulary established so that they can comprehend more difficult texts as they advance through school. In reality, vocabulary instruction has been neither frequent nor systematic in most schools. In order to grasp and retain words and comprehend text, students need incremental repeated exposure in a variety of contexts to the words they're trying to learn. So take that idea and compare it with the task of looking up a definition in a dictionary. That, that task doesn't afford the incremental repeated exposure in a variety of contexts um, in a way that would count as robust vocabulary instruction. When students make multiple connections between a new word and their own experience, they develop a nuanced and flexible understanding of the word they are learning. That idea of flexible understanding is communicated clearly in the Common Core standards. Um, students can learn not only what a word means, but also how to use that word in a variety of contexts. You should be familiar with terminology from flashcards that you've made and been practicing. Um, these terms appear and are used frequently in the y word exam. Examples of words are morpheme, base word, root word, prefix, suffix, affix. Some skills that are addressed in this presentation also connect to content from the y word. We've got develop word analysis skills and strategies in addition to phonics, including structural analysis, Identification of common morphemes, recognition of common prefixes, knowledge of Latin and Greek roots to form English words, use of context clues to help identify words and to verify pronunciation and meaning of words. 
In the Common Core Standards and Essential Elements, we can learn more about vocabulary instruction. All of the focus on vocabulary is really nested within the idea of comprehending more fully while reading listening. You can find specific vocabulary standards under the language strand, and each content area has its own specialized vocabulary. So vocabulary acquisition and use standards are relevant across disciplines. Let's look at grade seven. We're gonna start with 7.4, which is the, the broad standard to determine or clarify meaning of unknown and multiple meaning words and phrases based on grade seven reading and content and choosing flexibly from a range of strategies. Two substandards here are using context, um, the overall meaning of a sentence or paragraph, a word's position or function in a sentence as a clue to the meaning of the word or phrase. The second substandard here is to use common, grade appropriate Greek or Latin affixes and roots as clues to the meaning of the word. Now compare this with first grade, same idea is represented to determine or clarify meaning of unknown and multiple meaning words, in this case based on grade one reading, also choosing flexibly from the array of strategies. And then the context here is focused on using sentence level context as a clue to the meaning of a word. For our morphological awareness focus, we've got identify frequently occurring root words and their inflectional forms. In seventh grade, it was Greek and Latin roots and affixes. Here, it's commonly occurring roots and inflectional forms. We'll learn some more examples of inflectional forms in a moment. For the essential elements, these are the extended standards for students with complex communication needs. Um, we've got the framing of with guidance and support. Students would demonstrate understanding of words used in everyday routines with guidance and support, sort common objects into familiar categories, and identify real life connections between words and their use. The categories of vocabulary um, words range in complexity and progression across grade levels. So we start at kindergarten, first grade, second grade with spatial and temporal terms or simple verbs. Grades three, four, five with idioms and opposites. Grades six, seven, eight with similes, so comparisons using like and as. Roots and affixes, synonyms, antonyms, compound words, multiple meaning words, and conjunctions of the verb to be. So am, is, are, was, were. Grades nine to 12 are literal and figurative language, including figures of speech. Some terminology will come into play here when we look at morphological awareness. So the idea of a root word like accept in unacceptable and affixes being our prefix and suffix like un and able are two types of um, morphemes. We've got bound and free or unbound morphemes. And then the um, unbound category has inflectional and derivational morphemes. So we'll explain more about what these mean. We've got to begin our instruction on morphological awareness by knowing our roots first. So some common examples appear in the handout on Canvas. Um, an example of a Greek root is bio, it means life, and you hear it in the word biology and the word biography. For the Latin roots, a common Latin um, root is cent, it means 100, and you hear it in the word century and percent. Once our roots are covered, we can work on our affixes. Um, an inflectional suffix, so think back to that um, grade one inflectional form, is a suffix that's added to a word, it keeps the same word class or part of speech. So for example, we've got key and keys. The S on the end of keys is a plural noun marker that tells us there's more than one key. Other examples are the third person singular verb, the ED past tense verb ending, the ING progressive verb ending, the EN past part participle, the apostrophe S singular possessive, ER comparative adjective, and EST superlative adjective. Derivational suffixes, on the other hand, um, change the part of speech of a word. Most are Latin in origin. Some examples would be ment, idi, and shun. They turn words into noun, um, noun forms. So think of contentment, ferocity. Um, full, us, and all turn words into adjectives. So compare joy, a noun, with joyous, an adjective. 
And ly, like in the word quickly, turns a word into an adverb. Morphological awareness means consciously recognizing and comprehending and manipulating phonemes to figure out the meaning of a new word or to generate words that fit a given meaning. We can explicitly teach morphological awareness and research, um, actually a growing body of research now, tells us that this will benefit all students in our class, that morphological awareness will enhance students' existing skills by providing them with a tool to use when they encounter a challenging word in text. Carlyle's work shows that about 60% of new words a student reads in academic text is made up of familiar morphemes that, that can lead the reader to its meaning. So I'm gonna go through some procedures for teaching, developing vocabulary, and building morphological awareness. These align with Common Core standards, and I'll specify what um, the research shows in terms of who the participants were that might warrant a case for you to try, try this out in your classroom. First one is clue word strategy. Hellman, Calhoun, and Kern in 2014 published their study that they had conducted with English learners with learning disabilities. In ninth grade, they taught them what they called the clue word strategy, which was a set of eight cognitive steps that the student could use to derive meaning of unknown words from an instructional context. So they gave them a passage of informational text from science textbook and had students read the sentence, look for context clues, reread the sentence, write the target word, break the word into morphemes, write the meaning of the morpheme, predict and write the meaning of the targeted word, and then check reference material to verify the correct meaning. So let's break what break down what this looks like. We've got a text, a slug known as the stomach foot or gastropod crawled around the marine land. That is a very uh, strong sample of academic language. We've got the appositive where we've got stomach foot in quotes, the commas separate out this or a gastropod target word here to tell us um, sort of a, a hint of a definition. And um, I've added a picture as a contextual support for, for us as learners in finding out more about this strategy. So the, the study introduced students to this graphic organizer to help them, um, as one of their cognitive strategies, break down the meaning of the word. So we've got the whole word gastropod broken down into morphemes, gastro and pod. Gastro means stomach, pod means foot. So a being such as a slug known as a stomach foot that crawls on land. Um, the reference material then tells us any various mollusks of the class gastropoda, such as the snail, slug, having a single coiled shell or no shell at all, a ventral muscular foot for locomotion known as stomach foot mollusks. Another um, strategy that we can use for structural analysis is um, dissect and lens and hughes in 1990 published a study that um, they had conducted with students with learning disabilities and taught this dissect strategy it's a mnemonic um, an acronym dissect where each letter offers a step to assist a struggling reader to identify unknown words so we've got step one discover the content isolate the prefix separate the suffix say the stem, examine the stem, check with someone, and try technology. I, I actually modified the last one it had said try the dictionary, but I upgraded from the 1990 publication to the 21st century and figured that maybe students would be um, able to use electronic dictionaries, visual thesaurus, um, other word learning resources in a one-to-one -one computing context. So we've got um, the first step again, discover the context. It requires you to skip over unknown words, read to the end of the sentence, then use context of the sentence to guess the meaning. If the guess doesn't match or move you forward, you try the next step, which is isolate the prefix. You look at the first um, few letters to see if there is a prefix. Maybe you even have a notebook with a list of common prefixes that you can refer to to try to figure out the meaning of that prefix. Once the prefix is spotted in the word, you can draw a box around it to separate it from the other parts of the word. After you've separated the prefix, you look for and separate a suffix in a similar manner, and then say the stem or root or base, whichever language you're, you're using to refer to that um, free morpheme. 
attempt to pronounce the stem of the word. If the stem is recognized, say the prefix stem and suffix together. If it cannot be named, then move to the next step, which um, in this case is examine the stem and they're giving strategies to help be able to pronounce the word here. So if the stem or part of the stem begins with a vowel, separate the first two letters to pronounce them. If it begins with a consonant, separate the first three letters to pronounce them and continue to apply the rule until the end of the stem is reached. If the stem is still not identifiable after rule one, take off the first letter of the stem and use rule one for the remainder of the stem. When two vowels are together, use what you know about pronunciation to try different possibilities. If at the end of step five here, the word still cannot be identified, um, check with the dictionary or someone to help recognize that word. So in this check with someone, it could be a teacher, parent, classmate, um, depending on where and when this text is encountered. And the final step was try the dictionary or try technology. So you could look up the word, um, use pronunciation information, pronounce the word, read the definition, and learn more about its application. The next um, teaching routine here was described in a book by Robert Marzano in 2006, and then um, my colleague Karen and I did a, a study where we um, taught fifth graders who were English learners with learning difficulties, some had learning disabilities or other health impairments, and we embedded some self-regulation procedures into the routine. So it connected uh, with the vocabulary acquisi acquisition standards, but also the social emotional learning standards because um, students were able to learn to recognize expressions, communicate um, feelings, thoughts, emotions. They also practiced some self-regulation or self-determination skills like goal setting um, and then self-monitoring and self-evaluating their understanding and word learning throughout the study. So I've linked to the um, Wisconsin Social Emotional Learning Competencies and under self-awareness and self-management, some of what we did in the vocabulary study um, aligns with skills that we would want to teach really across the grade span here at that um, pre-K all the way through fifth grade. So one, one thing that we included in the study was a vocabulary knowledge scale. It's a self-report assessment. We used it as a pretest um, and gave students a list of words and a, a system for rating their level of knowledge about each word. Maybe from the, I don't remember having seen it before. I think I've seen it. I don't know what it means. I've seen it. I think it means blah, blah, blah. I don't know the word or I'm sorry, I know the word and it means this, or I can use the word in a sentence. So they kind of use just a rating system. Um, in this case, we um, had space to collect evidence. So if they were marking that they could use it in a sentence, then they also were providing a sentence. Um, our routine here had six steps to it. We described words using um, images, video clips, real life objects, um, words were from a connected text and then students restated and paraphrased definition. They wrote and draw pictures about the meaning. Um, then we provided some activities and um, structured cooperative learning so that they could practice using the words with peers um, and played some games to reinforce word learning. So for example, um, say the word was collocation we would have had that word from a text um, given a sort of student-friendly description. So a collocation is two or more words that are frequently used together. Um, and then students would have a graphic organizer where they would have recorded that word collocation, provide some um, images and support to help break down the word. In this case, we've got co and locate as two meaningful units that we can focus on. Um, and maybe also remind ourselves of other words that have that co-prefix, like co-teach, and think about that meaning two people being together. In this case, collocation is two words frequently located near each other. We give some, um, in some cases, videos. In this case, there's like a, a visual here to show collocations with the words catch and save. So you can catch fire, catch a bus, catch a ball, but you can't catch time, um, you can't catch energy, 
a collocation for save might be save time, save space. These words frequently occur together. Um, so we would say save money, but we might not say save site. That doesn't sound like typical English language. Other collocations with the word weather, you could say things like beautiful weather, lovely weather, excellent weather, awful weather, bad weather, horrible weather, enjoy the weather, check the weather. Um, the next step after doing some examples and visuals and explanations was to have people, um, have students restate the word collocation. So we used um, peers to practice pronounce, pronouncing the words. Uh, collocation is two or more words that are frequently used together. And then step three was to draw some way of representing what this word meant to each student. The drawing looked a little bit different Then we engaged in some activities. So one example of an activity would be um, vocabulary tic-tac-toe, where um, partners get to place the, the X or O on the tic-tac-toe board if they can give the definition of the word that appears in the space where they're going to position their X or O. And the idea is to try to get three in a row. So all of the words on this tic-tac-toe board um, are vocabulary words that you would hear in a class maybe focused on teaching English as a second language. Step five was to do some cooperative learning structures and engage in conversation, possibly using both languages to talk about the new words. So one example might be to do a semantic map. Some others could be doing semantic feature analysis. Um, numbered heads together was a um, cooperative learning structure we used. So I might pose a question to the whole group like, which is a better synonym for collocation, arrangement or pigeonhole? Then students talk with their partners and um, I might call on number three and whoever in the, the group is a number three would provide an answer. Um, they could repeat with other questions, why is collocation with rain, which is a collocation with rain, thick or heavy? Um, we would say heavy rain, but not necessarily thick rain why should we learn collocations? And so you can pose different questions and use that number of heads together cooperative learning sequence. Step six was to play games. Um, Taboo is a, a packaged um, board game, but we just kind of replicated with index cards and our own um, voice as a buzzer to play that game taboo. So these six steps provided um, really all three points of what, what it means to provide strong vocabulary instruction, students had context, repetition, were able to use the word in, in a variety of ways, um, and flexibly practice making meaning with targeted words in this case. Other examples of games, if taboo isn't one that's familiar to you, could be something like vocab twister, uh, bingo, matching, dominoes, the concentration or memory game, and um, word association games. So morphology is um, a fun and powerful instructional um, activity. I've got on the screen here a picture of what we would call a word matrix, and I linked in the interactive notebook to a free word matrix generator. Um, so our root word here is heal. We've got a prefix un, and we can add um, inflectional morphemes and derivational mor morphemes here to make uh, a wide range of words, unhealthy, healing, healthier, healthiest. Um, so we can practice seeing which words we can make on this matrix. Other examples of morphemic um, awareness activities could include um, interactive notebooks where students have prefixes and fold back the commonly occurring prefix to write on the notebook paper a word. So if the the tab had dis, we could write words like dislike, disrespectful. Um, really options are kind of limitless for materials that you can use and assemble to practice prefix, root word, suffix. Two um, ends of a plastic egg can contain the prefix suffix. The inside can be the root word or a definition and then they have to guess what the word is. Um, other foldables might have the um, commonly occurring root word with the foldable that you can read to make new words. There's an example of mill being a prefix in the, the words that are um, on the flaps folded in, say millennium, millipede, milliliter, millimeter. Uh, when you lift up the flap, you can write the definition or give an example of the word. 
I'm going to stop recording and make a second video where we'll learn more about word sorts.